6. Verities When I think of my senior year in high school, I think of my court. It had three houses on it. The yellow house on the corner was the Campbell house. Mr. Campbell was a crotchety old man who came out and yelled at us if we made the intolerable transgression of stepping in his yard. He never said hello or even acknowledged his neighbor's presence unless it was to complain about some egregious violation of some minute HOA regulation, such as a non-approved paint color on the trim of a garage or a basketball hoop installed without a permit. The other house on the court was the O'Reilly family's. Mr. Campbell I ignored, but the O'Reilly's were like family, their house just being an extension of my own, a bright and lively extension as well. The O'Reilly's had three children. Bryce O'Reilly was a senior in high school like me. His sister Emily was 16, and their little brother Toby was 11. They had two dogs, a golden retriever and a black lab, as well as a rabbit, two birds, and a gerbil. Mr. O'Reilly was in the army, and we made great use of his retired fatigues and paintball guns. Mrs. O'Reilly taught preschool. In the basement, beside the pool table, her desk was littered with books like Elmo Goes to the Store and Everybody Poops. One Sunday afternoon, Bryce was sitting on the bumper of my car, tapping his feet and running his fingers through his hair. Bryce was always restless. There was a low grumble from the street as a red Camaro decelerated to pull into the court. Vanessa, our mutual friend from school, had come over to study with me for a chemistry test. She was a year behind us but was in advanced classes. Not too shabby. She parked under the plum tree at the edge of my yard. The Camaro had been an indulgence of her father, for himself, before he had settled down and had a family. Now Vanessa had inherited the oversized sports car and complained about how hard it was to park. Bryce and I would have traded the ten-year-old sedans we were stuck with any time, but once Vanessa stepped out of the car, our minds shifted to things besides cars. She had stepped on some plums and bent forward to pick them out of her sandals. We both probably saw more of her cleavage than she intended. I walked over to help her with her books, trying not to betray the desire I felt. Bryce knew me well enough to detect my interest in Vanessa, and perhaps her interest in me. That afternoon, we had been playing paintball in the woods behind my house. She was early, and I had leaves and brambles in my hair. Justin, you're a mess. Why don't you take a shower? Vanessa, why don't you join him to make sure he gets clean? I don't want you seen with a filthy guy. I was nervous. So was Vanessa. Bryce laughed at both of us. Bryce and I grew up together. In our younger days, we had tromped through the woods behind my house, jumping over creeks and sliding down muddy embankments. On summer nights, we stretched out in the driveway, throwing balls of aluminum foil in the air so that bats would attack them, mistaking them for insects. We sneaked out at night and peeped into people's bedrooms from trees, hid from passing car lights and bushes, and considered all of this thrilling. Mr. Campbell wasted many a breath warning us not to go in his yard. During truth or dare games, we would run around his house or ring his doorbell, causing him to call the police, or worse, our parents. In junior high, Bryce and I discovered fire and all its wonderful properties. When coaxed onto a tennis ball with gasoline, it made a spectacular fireball for a thrilling game of street hockey. Fire could also be used to spell out expletives with flammable rubber cement, which Bryce eagerly demonstrated on Mr. Campbell's sidewalk. In high school, we retired from tormenting Mr. Campbell. We let that torch be passed on to Bryce's brother, Toby, and his friends. Bryce and I would place bets as to how many times Mr. Campbell would come out to yell at children in a single afternoon, keeping track on three-by-five note cards like old folks at a bingo game. It was like a game. There were teams, underdogs, and star players, like Toby's friend Taylor, who always seemed to kick the soccer ball into Mr. Campbell's garage. When this happened, Bryce and I would stand on our chairs for a better view of the drama. After screaming at the kids and threatening to call their parents, Mr. Campbell would always look over at us, as if we had instigated the whole thing. We would smile and wave. He never waved back. At Halloween our senior year in high school, 
Bryce and I were too old to trick-or-treat, so we decided to jump out of the bushes and scare kids coming up the court. Kids started coming to our court just to be scared. Later that night, Bryce and I even got our hands on some fake swords and put on a great show where we took turns killing each other. Fake blood capsules and all. One night early in November, before I was dating Vanessa, Carrie Rockford came over. It was a blustery night and our old couch was sitting in the driveway. The Salvation Army was coming to pick it up in the morning. Carrie grabbed a blanket and we snuggled on the couch, watching the treetops and leaves dance in the wind against a backdrop of stars. The scene was a little surreal, sitting on a living room sofa in a driveway, the wind whipping Carrie's hair. I remember I liked the idea of having Carrie around, but I didn't necessarily like her. She was kind of dull, very attractive, but she only talked about people at school and which football player was dating which cheerleader. I think she may have liked Bryce more than me anyway. That sometimes happened. Bryce was the ultimate test of my girlfriends. If they liked him, they were acceptable. If they liked him too much, they were rejected. The best example of this system came from my sophomore year. I was getting to know a girl named Samantha. Bryce and I both noticed how she paid him more attention when he was around than she did to me. I wasn't exactly broken up about it. It was just that Samantha kept telling me that she was really into me. Then one day she came over and I wasn't home. So she just dropped by Bryce's place. One thing led to another and she asked if she could blow him. Bryce, who had inherited his father's brawn as well as his good looks, personally carried Samantha to the front steps set her down outside, and slammed the door on her. He was very proud of himself that day. He recounted it all to me later, insisting that no one lies to my best friend to get to me. Vanessa and I became a lot closer after our classmate Maria Lofton died. The funeral was mid-December. I remember standing outside in the courtyard of the church. Vanessa was beside me. She was wearing a gray sweater. Mine was navy blue and made my skin itch. I didn't move to scratch because that would force Vanessa to remove her hand from the crook of my elbow. She had put it there because she was upset. The whole senior class was at the church. Vanessa was only a junior, but she was in a few senior courses with Maria and myself. We talked with Mrs. Hardy, my English teacher, and a friend of my mother's. I kept looking down at my feet and the gray flagstones with black moss growing in between them. Maria would have been our valedictorian if she had not died. Junior year, she'd sat in front of me in chemistry class. I would play with her hair, which was so black that it was almost blue. The last time I had seen Maria was after school a few days before she died. I had helped her with her college admissions essay. She was a good writer on her own, but she was also thorough and wanted to get a second opinion on her essay. I remember thinking it was really good, better than all of mine. I kept going over that afternoon, replaying it in my mind for some sign of the depression Maria apparently suffered from. I had been too obtuse to see it. Almost all of us had. We thought she had been perfect. She would have had her pick of colleges. Instead, she killed herself with Prozac and a bottle of champagne. She was wearing her homecoming dress when they found her unresponsive in her bed. Her suicide note had read, Isn't it obvious? After the funeral, Vanessa and I went to the International House of Pancakes for lunch. The place was all cheery with Christmas decorations, but we didn't feel very cheerful. We were in no rush to get back to school, but we were too spent to talk. That was when I realized we were comfortable enough just to sit with each other, not talking, just pouring syrup, eating pancakes, stirring coffee. She always put sweet and low in her coffee then tucked the wrapper beneath her mug. I could always tell how many cups she had drunk by the number of wrappers that stuck to the bottom of her mug. She always had at least three cups. In January, I was asked to speak at the National Honor Society induction. Vanessa was being inducted, so her family and I went out to dinner beforehand. I was too nervous to eat much. I had never given a speech to such a large crowd. While waiting backstage beforehand, I ran to the bathroom and vomited. I was sitting on the floor of the stall when I heard someone come inside. Justin, my man, where are you? Bryce? 
The door to my stall opened, and Bryce stood looking down on me. Bryce wasn't in NHS, not by a long shot. His mother was always after him to raise his grades, but he didn't seem to worry about that too much. He was wearing slacks, a bright white shirt, just from the dry cleaners, and a leather vest. His tie was crooked and clashed with his vest. I felt embarrassed and weak sitting there on the floor in my oversized suit and my dinner floating in the yellow water beside me. Bryce's face grimaced when he looked in the toilet. I'm a little nervous, I said. You got that right. Bryce picked me up by the armpits and told me to stand up straight. There's a thousand people in there, including Vanessa and her family. I want to make a good impression, I said. You know, Samantha is in there too. Maybe I should sit by her. I couldn't help laughing. Bryce moved us to the sink to help me clean up. I could see Bryce's reflection beside mine in the mirror. His skin, in comparison to mine, was more tanned, his shoulders broader, and his head higher. His face was dark with a manly five o'clock shadow. His lacrosse teammates would have laughed if they'd seen him so dressed up. But he had come to hear me give my speech, and his hands patting me through the shoulder pads of my blazer made me forget that I was nervous. He said he would cheer for me when I got up on stage. It's National Honor Society, dude. There is no cheering. I'll manage something. I went and took my place on stage, dreading whatever Bryce was going to do when I stepped up to the podium. The stage was like limbo. It was completely dark ahead of me and completely dark behind me. The principal finished his introduction, and I got up with my speech in hand. My mouth tasted of bile and breath mints. My hands were shaking. I knew Vanessa was in the audience, although I couldn't even see the audience. Just as I stepped up behind the microphone, in that terrible moment before I had to utter my first words, I heard a man clearing his throat. Then he coughed and sniffed, finishing it up with a hawking sound, as if he were about to spit. Anyone else would have thought it was an old man, someone's grandpa with emphysema dragged out of the old folks' home to the ceremony. But I knew it was Bryce's signal. No one else had such a unique sense of discretion. I wondered if he was sitting by Samantha. Then I thought of her offering to suck Bryce off, and imagined her expression as he dropped her on her ass out his front door. I almost laughed. My heart was bursting with love for him. Everyone loved my speech. I talked about hard work paying off, the value of scholarship, and its necessity for future success and ultimately changing the world. In retrospect, I realized I was just regurgitating the gospel of upward mobility, which we were being rewarded for having internalized with a little NHS pin that we could wear on our sweater vests and letter jackets, a pin that would remind us that we, indeed, were on the trajectory our upper-middle-class parents and teachers desired for us. It was the best one in all the 34 years that we've had the National Honor Society, the principal told me. He put his arm around my shoulders and said in a low voice that it was at this point in high school that he and the teachers could see which students were pulling away from the pack. He said that I was on the right trajectory and not to veer off, even if I saw others diverging. That was just a fact of life, he said. I wasn't sure what exactly he meant. I was glad to get away from him and pose for pictures with Vanessa and Bryce. To me, everything felt so perfect and solidified that night. Our lives, just like the lives of those families we saw on TV. This was how the story was supposed to go. It was February that we knew something was wrong at the O'Reilly's house. They always went to upstate New York to visit Mr. O'Reilly's brother. This time, Mr. O'Reilly went alone. His family stayed behind. I went over to inquire. The house smelled of bread baking in the oven and Mrs. O'Reilly's scented candles all the sense of a happy home life. Bryce and Toby watched cartoons on TV. At a commercial, I asked if there was any reason they had not gone to New York with their father. Dad wanted to go alone. Bryce used the tone of voice that always meant our conversation on the present topic was at an end. I got the rest of the story from my mom. The O'Reillys were having fights. Mr. O'Reilly said he wasn't in love anymore. 
Shortly after that, Vanessa came over and I helped her with her history paper. We were still only friends, but later she said that was the first night she was tempted to kiss me. She got an A on the paper, so she took me out to dinner at this little rustic inn in historic Clifton, this little town that had barely changed since the Civil War. Vanessa wore a white blouse and a red pleated skirt. It was a great night. The restaurant was in a 200-year-old building. The wood floors were slanted from the way the foundation had settled over time. Every step the waiters took elicited a creak or moan from the floor. The candles on our table were reflected on the inside of the windows while rain splashed the outside. I couldn't remember ever being so happy. It was still raining when we drove home. The little country roads flooded. We drove through some standing water that splashed against her Camaro's fenders. Leaves floated by the tires. It was dangerous. The low-slung car could have sucked water in one of the intakes and seized up with vapor lock. But we laughed anyway. Vanessa rolled down the window and stuck out the ice scraper, as if she were rowing. We made it back to her place and watched a movie. Looking at her standing in front of the TV, I was fascinated by how her skirt hung so elegantly off the soft mound that it concealed. The next week was Valentine's Day. I gave her roses. The following weekend, we went on a ski trip. In the cabin, we kissed. We confessed that we loved each other. After that, we were an item, as they say. There were awful days when I would go into my garage and look at Bryce's driveway. I was checking if his father had left yet. One day it was spring, and I remember the cherry blossoms gathered on the roof of Mr. O'Reilly's Honda Accord while it waited in the driveway. The trunk tied down with rope and filled past its capacity with cardboard boxes. A few lamps, golf clubs, and a small mahogany table were piled in the back seat. Mr. O'Reilly, a big man with fuzzy brown hair like Bryce's, caught me staring. He didn't say anything, just frowned as if to say, It's a shame, isn't it? He flicked his keys out of his pocket, opened the door to the car, then drove away. No one else was on the court to see him leave. Bryce insisted that he didn't care if his father left. Bryce's mom now had three kids, two dogs, two birds, and two rodents to take care of by herself. Shortly after that, I remember sitting in Bryce's sister Emily's room. I had come over to find Bryce, but he wasn't home. She had just gotten out of the shower and was in her bathrobe. Her hair was dripping, and she sat against the wall with her knees to her chest. She was naked beneath that robe. I had seen her breasts once during a game of truth or dare. She had wide pink nipples. Vanessa's nipples were smaller and redder. Emily was comfortable with me. She didn't mind if I was in her room while she was in her bathrobe. She just wanted to talk. She knew I would listen. My dad told my mom that he doesn't love her anymore, she said. I don't think Bryce loves me either. That's not true, I said. How do you know, Justin? Bryce doesn't talk to anyone anymore. I didn't have anything to say. She was right. It was late March and the cross season had started. Bryce was never home. He was always at practice, and his late nights were spent with his lacrosse teammates. Mine with Vanessa. Emily's room was like a miniature universe complete with moon and sun decorations on her sheets and stationery, old-style sun and moons like on medieval illuminations. There were also glow-in-the-dark stars above her bed. I was leaving for a journalism class trip the next day. I felt awful. Emily's eyes were shut tightly while she wiped them with the edge of her bathrobe. I couldn't leave her like that. I felt like my own family was breaking up. I had no brothers or sisters. The O'Reillys were my siblings, but I left anyway. The journalism trip was to New York. I thought of the O'Reillys the whole way. I called Vanessa when I got to the hotel. My tears ran from my cheek onto the phone. She was so good to me. She promised me that things always work out for the best. She would run her fingers through my hair and make me tea when I got home. I missed her in New York and thought only of returning to her. I took special pride in the fact that I could go for a walk with her, sit her down on a park bench and kiss her, touch her. No one else was as lucky as I was. When I got the acceptance letter from Georgetown in April, 
my parents were not home. I ran over to the O'Reilly's instead. It had just rained and mud splashed on the letter as I sprinted through their yard. Mrs. O'Reilly opened the door and congratulated me. She said she had never doubted that I would be accepted. She looked tired and weary. She said she wished her Bryce had worked as hard for the past four years as I had. Now all Bryce did was stay out late and ignore his curfew. There were rings under her eyes. I realized that I couldn't remember the last time she didn't have rings there or when Bryce and I had last hung out. The dogs were trying to push through the door to me. She held them back with her leg. That was a Friday. That weekend, Vanessa came over and we made cupcakes with blue icing and white G's on them for Georgetown. I took them to school and celebrated, giving them to all the secretaries in the office, my teachers, and the students in my homeroom. Vanessa was happy for me, but I knew she would miss me. I assured her I would be home on weekends, since Georgetown was only an hour away by car. Occasionally, I went over to the O'Reilly's to see how things were. Bryce was never home. Neither was Emily. Toby was the only one around, and he was always watching television. I had to compete with cartoons and MTV for his attention. Where are the birds? Give them away. Why? Mom couldn't take care of him, I guess. How is she doing? I don't know. One Saturday night, Vanessa and I were getting out of her Camaro in my driveway when Bryce pulled in across the street and parked at an angle in his driveway, one tire on the lawn. I ran over. Bryce, man, we need to hang out. I said, coming up to him and clapping him on the back. I noticed he smelled like weed. I'm just dropping off some of my pads and uniforms. I need to wash them. I'm headed over to Harcher's place tonight. We're having a team party. Harcher was the captain of the lacrosse team. I followed Bryce into the garage where he emptied one of his duffel bags into a pile on the floor. Bryce, have you decided on what you are doing next year? Yep. I waited for him to elaborate. The O'Reilly's had a mud room attached to the garage with a washer-dryer set. Bryce entered, turned the knobs on the washer, stuffed in his uniform and pads, and poured in detergent. Water sprayed into the barrel. He slammed down the lid. I finally asked, Well, what are you doing? Dad wants me to go to West Point. That's great, I said. I knew going to West Point required an appointment from a senator. Did you get appointed? Bryce unlatched a trunk on the floor of the garage and rummaged around inside, digging around spare lacrosse sticks, heads, pads, and balls until he found what he was looking for. A half-empty bottle of Jack Daniels. He pulled it out and closed the lid of the trunk. Nope. He walked back to the car. I followed. Then what are you doing, Bryce? Dad has me sign up to repeat senior year at some military school out in the Blue Ridge Mountains. He says if I do a year there, I might be able to get into West Point. Like him. Oh. I stood there processing what he had said, sharing my thoughts aloud like some sort of idiot. So you're not going to college next year? Not all of us are that lucky. He swung open the door to his car and tossed in the bottle of J.D. Bryce, why don't you come over and hang with me and Vanessa tonight? We're going to watch a movie. Maybe another time. On April 17th, I got a ticket from school security because my parking pass had expired. It meant three detentions. On my lunch break, I went over to the little Catholic chapel next door and asked the nun, who was the caretaker, if I could sit there a while. But I didn't finish my sentence. I began to cry. She came over and hugged me. It wasn't about the ticket. It was about Bryce and his family. I felt like my family, my life was coming apart. Everything that had always seemed so permanent wasn't. It was like I had counted on so many guarantees that had turned out to have never been there in the first place. Graduation was in early June, which is technically still spring but it felt like summer beneath those black robes. Afterwards, everyone gathered with their families to take pictures, pictures that would sit on their desks in their first-year dorms at college. My graduation party was on my back deck. 
Vanessa and my parents had tied blue and gray balloons along the railings. The cake had a picture of Georgetown on it. Gray smoke from the grill blew around everyone while they ate off paper plates. My relatives were there, and my neighbors, including the O'Reillys. Mrs. O'Reilly was wearing a dress that she said made her look fat. Emily and Toby came for a little while. They looked bored without anyone their age to talk to. Bryce missed the party. By evening, Vanessa and I were the only ones left. I should have felt happy. And I guess I did, but the fact that Bryce had not shown up bothered me. I heard him pull up into their driveway later that night, but he left shortly after. Vanessa and I cleaned up the wreckage of the party after my parents had gone to bed. It took two hours to deflate the balloons, clear all the plates, and wash the casserole dishes. I watched while Vanessa scraped some brown flaky debris from a pan. I just wanted to lose myself in her, in playfulness, in something light to escape from the cloud of thoughts and feelings I was trying to shove to the back of my mind. I flicked water on her. She spun around and hosed me down with the dish sprayer. I tickled her until she submitted, and then we spent another hour cleaning up the new mess we had made, whipping each other with dish towels whenever one of us caught the other turning their back. Everything will be just fine, I told myself. It was around eleven when we finished. We spooned on the couch and watched TV. When the show was over, I turned off the television and dropped the remote control to the floor. While our eyes were adjusting to the dark, the only sound was the static from the cooling television. I pulled Vanessa closer. She had blue eyes with streaks of brown along the edges of her pupils. I always told her they looked like eclipsed suns. She was wearing shorts that she would eventually unbutton and leave on the floor with her bra and my jeans. I ran my hands all over her skin, the friction making a soft sound, like an orange being peeled. I kissed her everywhere as we moved in cadence. After we had both come, I laid my head on her rising and falling breasts, and I told her I would always love her. She told me the same. We were forever. Nothing would change that. Our bodies were moist from one another and tired from our lovemaking, so we fell asleep with our arms and legs intertwined. Within a year, we wouldn't even speak to each other.